To survive the Gulag, prisoners had to compete not only with the elements, the authorities, the work and the starvation, but also with other prisoners. Suspicion, jealousy and violence pervaded a world where prisoners fought for access to the limited necessities of life. Prisoners stole food and clothes from each other. They grabbed credit for the labor output of others. They informed to curry favor with authorities. They even raped and beat to satisfy desires for sex, power, and violence. Prisoners had to make quick judgments about other inmates. Knowing whom to trust was key for survival. Was the prisoner sitting next to you an informer? A member of a violent criminal gang? Part of a rival nationalist group or even a potential rapist? Wartime Gulag prisoner Janusz Bardak captured the uncertainties. Chelevyek, chelevyek volk. Man is wolf to man. My mother had taught me this phrase when I was a child. Now it bore into my heart every day, every hour, as I saw prisoners fight each other savagely for pica or a puff of a cigarette. Heard them curse, cry, and moan. Smelled their decaying, rotting bodies. Saw them die. I could be forced to lie on a bench in this or in another bathhouse and be repeatedly raped not by my oppressors, whom I considered to be the NKVD guards, but by my fellow prisoners. For the first time I realized how vulnerable I was. Only 22, alone, and still too weak to resist an assault. Conflict and violence pervaded the Gulag, but so too did solidarity, compassion, and the close bonds forged in hardship. Finding allies was critical to survival. Often alliances followed the same lines as conflict. Prisoners within the same ethnic group often looked out for one another. Criminal gangs provided protection for their own members and their favored friends. People from the same political party, religion, or region. Speakers of the same language. People with similar interests. Mothers. There were many ways for prisoners to find common cause with one another. Prisoners who survived their first months in camps were more likely to survive their full sentences precisely because they had developed support networks. Prisoners formed particularly intense relationships, whether in love or in hatred. Simple human compassion was not uncommon, even when it meant sacrificing your own chance for survival. At times, even the free Soviet population, or Gulag guards themselves, would find the courage to help a struggling prisoner. Such acts posed grave danger for those who helped, because the Soviet authorities understood any sign of solidarity with prisoners as evidence of an anti-Soviet viewpoint. Every day, Gulag guards announced the march to work. A step to the left or a step to the right is considered an attempt to escape. We will shoot without warning. Sadistic guard behavior toward inmates was a hallmark of Gulag life. Blatant murder of prisoners could be covered up with two simple words. Attempted escape. Soviet authorities constantly sought to prevent any sympathy from the guards for their prisoners. Guards were constantly reminded that they were the steel in the state's sword battling the evil prisoners, enemies bent on destroying the glorious society being built in the Soviet Union. Propaganda hammered home the supposed perversions and dangers of these anti-Soviet, virtually subhuman prisoners. Conditions in the camps did little to belie the characterizations of the propaganda especially if Gulag authorities could keep guards from getting to know prisoners on a personal level. Working conditions for the guards reinforced the propaganda. While Gulag guards certainly had it easier than the prisoners, serving on a prisoner's convoy in the harsh environments of Siberia was a difficult job. No amount of clothing completely protected a person in a Kalima winter. And in these freezing temperatures, Gulag guards were required to maintain high vigilance, for they could be severely punished, could even become Gulag prisoners themselves if an escape happened under their watch. The entire Gulag apparatus was set up with incentives that heavily punished guards for prisoner escapes, but rarely found fault with guard violence against prisoners and often even rewarded violence against prisoners under the guise of preventing escapes. In such circumstances, guard brutality was unsurprising. Yet somehow, amidst all of this, signs of humanity, of guards taking pity on the prisoners, were surprisingly common. 
Surviving the Gulag required at various points willpower, mental toughness, skill, ruthlessness, and no small amount of luck. Every Gulag survivor attributed survival to a series of small strategies, always knowing that fate and the kindness of others also played significant roles. A great many Gulag memoirists attribute their survival to their retreat into the life of the mind. Prisoners wrote and recited poetry in the camps, told stories, discussed philosophy and history, anything to keep their minds active. Other prisoners created chess sets, took up embroidery, art or music using whatever was available, tree bark for canvas, pig blood for paint. As the memoirists themselves recognized, though, survival was not always so clearly noble. Many Gulag memoirists openly struggled in their writings with the ethical quandaries of survival. Soviet authorities had created a system that forced prisoners to compete constantly for access to limited means of survival. Where did one draw the ethical line in the struggle to survive? Was it morally acceptable to work as a brigade leader, a medical assistant with no medical training, an informant? Did the prisoner who managed to steal a moment of rest during the work day harm his fellow brigade members' attempt to fulfill their labor quota? The gulag drove its inmates to desperation. A great many were forced to do things they would never have contemplated in regular surroundings. Some would literally blow a hand off hoping to become injured and thereby avoid hard labor. Others gave up and tried to take their own lives. Many only mentally survived by a retreat into religious or intellectual contemplation. But nothing ultimately could save those the prisoners called goners, reduced to digging through trash heaps or eating the rations of a dying friend in their desperation to survive. Across the former Soviet Union, millions lie in anonymous graves. Whether shot in a prison basement or killed in gulag camps by exhaustion, starvation, malnutrition-related illness, labor accident, or the violence of fellow prisoners and guards, Millions died at the hands of Soviet terror. Telling the story of the Gulag through the eyes of its prisoners inevitably excludes the stories of those millions who died. These victims did not make it out of the camps to publish memoirs. Their stories are buried beneath the grounds of Siberia, Kazakhstan, and the whole of the former Soviet Union. Even those who survived the camps emerged traumatized and brutalized. Readjusting to life outside the camps would be a struggle. Many former inmates maintained lifelong bonds with their fellow inmates after leaving the camps, and many continue to struggle to keep the Gulag's memory alive to prevent new human rights abuses in the countries of the former Soviet Union today.